Hello, I'm Mark, and together with my friend Vince, I use Inkscape to produce humorous cartoons and comic strips. We've got over 200 of them online if you want to take a look. I'm not much of an artist, that's mostly Vince's job, but I do know a lot about Inkscape. In this video, I'm going to talk about some regressions that were introduced in Inkscape 1.0 relating to the conversion of text to paths. I'll give you a little history, show you the problems, and also demonstrate workarounds. If you would prefer a written article about this subject, I covered this in part 100 of my series in Full Circle magazine, which can be downloaded free of charge from the link in the notes. What do I mean by a regression? In the strictest sense, it refers to an old bug or issue that gets reintroduced with a newer version of the software. But more generally, it's often used to describe a feature that used to work, but is broken in a newer release. It's that latter sense that I'm using here, as I describe a few related tricks and shortcuts that used to work in older Inkscape releases, but which are broken in versions 1.0 and 1.0.1. .1. You're probably familiar with Inkscape's Object to Path command, which can be found in the Path menu. As the name suggests, this converts an Inkscape object to a Bezier path. In doing so, it opens up more flexibility in editing, at the expense of losing access to the object-specific parameters. To see what I mean, let's begin with a simple star, created using Inkscape's Stars and Polygons tool. As you can see, when I double-click on it, that tool becomes selected, and the tool control bar updates to show me the parameters for stars and polygons. I can change the number of corners, switch between star and polygon mode, and do all the kaleidoscopic tweaking that makes this such a fun tool to play with. Now let's convert this to a path, using path, object to path. Now when I double click on it, the node tool becomes selected. I can move the individual nodes, add new ones, and generally tweak it like any other path. It has all the flexibility of a Bezier path, but it's lost the capability to be edited using the Stars and Polygons tool. With that general overview out of the way, let's talk about text. Back in the early days of Inkscape, converting text to a path would result in exactly what we've just seen, a single path for the entire text object. That's good for some tasks, but for others it makes more sense to have each letter as its own individual path. Splitting a complex path into individual letters can be tricky, so with version 0.48, the developers changed the feature so that applying object to path on a text object would result in a group which contains a path for each letter. But what if you still wanted a single path for the whole text string? Perhaps because you genuinely need that for your edits, or just because you're trying to follow an older tutorial that assumes that's what you'll get from the conversion. The obvious way to get a single string is to perform an object to path operation, then ungroup the result, and then perform a union on all the individual letter paths. And that works, but the developers also included a little shortcut that would take you straight from a text object to a single path. Ignore the object to path com command completely and jump straight to the union command instead. As you might imagine, this simpler approach became a common recommendation and also started appearing in newer tutorials. So we found ourselves in a situation where lots of videos and articles suggested using union whilst older sources receive notes, comments, or forum messages to the same effect. That is, until Inkscape 1.0 was released. This, unfortunately, has broken that shortcut. Let's take a look at 0.92 and 1.0 side by side, so we can see exactly what's changed. On the left here, I have version 0.92.3. On the right, I have version 1.0.1. I'm running Ubuntu Mate, and in order to have both versions running at the same time, I've had to install 1.0.1 .1 as a snap package. Unfortunately, that format has problems with some of the icons, which is why you can see a few symbolic icons mixed in with the usual coloured icons I prefer. But that's just a cosmetic issue, and it doesn't affect the functionality of the software. First, I have two text objects. If I select them, you can clearly see from the status bar that they're text objects and double clicking on them switches me to the text tool and lets me edit the content. I'm going to duplicate each of these objects using Ctrl D, then hold Shift and use the arrow keys to move them apart. I'll repeat that process so that there are three copies of each text object. With my first copy, 
I'm going to use object to path on 0.92. As you can see, this produces a group which contains a path for each letter in the string. If I do the same in version 1, you can see that this behaviour is unchanged. You still end up with a group of paths. Now with the second copy, I'm going to use the union command from the path menu. In 0.92, the result is a single path. In version 1, on the other hand, I appear to get an error message in the status bar. It tells me that one of the objects is not a path, so it can't perform a Boolean operation. Not great, but presumably it just failed and left my text untouched, right? Of course not. After a few seconds, the error message disappears from the status bar, and I'm returned to the usual line that tells me what I have selected. It's a group of objects. In practice, performing a union actually just does the same thing as object to path, but presents you with some error message that doesn't really apply. Fortunately, turning this group of paths into a single path is pretty simple. First, ungroup them, which leaves each individual path selected. Then use the union command to combine them all into a single path. But it's still a shame that we've lost a useful and well-publicised shortcut. If that was the end of the story, I probably wouldn't have bothered making a video about this. But the same change that broke the shortcut also introduced other traps for the unwary user. There are a few commands in Inkscape which are intended to work on paths, but which will automatically convert other objects to paths for you when you try to use them. Unfortunately, the change in behaviour for text conversions has also broken this automatic behaviour, as we will see. Again, I'll start with my two text objects from before, and this time I'll duplicate them three times. As you can see, in 0.92 I can use the inset and outset commands without having to convert the text to a path first, and looking at the status bar, it tells us that these are now single paths. Using the dynamic offset command presents me with a diamond-shaped handle that I can use to adjust the amount of offset giving me the ability to vary the inset or outset as I see fit. Switching to the select tool indicates that this is a dynamic offset object. In reality, that's just an SVG path with some extra Inkscape specific functionality attached to it, as we can see if we look at this object in the XML editor. As you can see, this is just an SVG path element. If we look at the attributes on the right, you can see an entry labeled Sidipity type that's set to a value of Inkscape offset. That's what tells Inkscape to treat this differently to any other path. And you can also see that we have an Inkscape radius attribute that holds the amount of offset to apply. You can even edit that value in here if you want to use a specific number, perhaps to make sure your offsets are the same across multiple shapes. But the key point is that this is just an SVG path with some extra Inkscape information. Do note that there's a bit of an odd bug going on in here, and I don't really understand why, because most of my elements are displaying their attributes absolutely fine. Just this one element, for whatever reason, is only showing the attribute names when I click on them. Doesn't seem to be affecting the program in any other way, so I'm not going to worry about it, but uh, that's just to explain this odd behavior that I'm seeing. Moving on to version 1, things misbehave very quickly. The inset command tells us there's no path to inset or outset. Then, a few seconds later, the status bar shows us that we now have a group of objects. Once again, the text has been converted to paths in the same way as if we'd used the object to path command, but clearly no insetting has taken place. The outset command misbehaves in the same way. But things get really weird when we try to use dynamic offset. There's no diamond shaped handle and the status bar tells us to drag to select objects to edit. Okay, let's do that. We'll try dragging a box around all the letters we want to offset. Well, that did nothing. What about if we click to select instead? Now we get the individual nodes appearing. Looking over at the toolbar, we begin to get a clearer idea of what's happened. The node tool is selected. Switching back to the select tool and clicking on the text shows us that familiar message indicating that an object to path conversion has occurred, but not the dynamic offset we were expecting. 
how can we work around these problems? Actually, the solution's pretty simple when you think about it. All these commands are happy to work with single paths, it's just the automatic conversion from text to a path that's broken. But we've already seen how to manually convert text to a single path in Inkscape 1.0. We just need to apply those steps before we use the inset, outset and dynamic offset commands. Let's go through the motions to make it clear. First, I'll clear out my work area and make three fresh duplicates of the text object. Now let's begin with the inset command. Before we can use it, we have to first convert the text to a group of paths using object to path. Next, we ungroup them. And then we use path union to turn them into a single path. Finally, we can perform our inset operation. The same for outset. First, object to path. Second, ungroup. Third, path union. And finally, we can do our outset. And of course, the same also applies to dynamic offset. First, object to path, then ungroup, then path union, and now we can apply our dynamic offset and move the diamond handle to adjust the amount. Because of course now we're just working on a path, not actually on a text object. There's one other command that has a related problem, but unlike the ones we've looked at already, this affects not only text, but other objects too. It's the linked offset command. Let's look at it on 0.92, starting with a star. I've given it a stroke, but no fill, as it makes it a little bit clearer as to what it's doing. At first, this command appears to be the same as dynamic offset. After selecting the menu entry, you're presented with a diamond shaped handle to adjust the offset amount. Once again, we can use it to create an inset or an outset, but whereas dynamic offset modifies the selected object, linked offset, leaves it untouched and instead creates a new object that's linked to the first. The new object can have its own color and style if you want. Most importantly, the original object maintains its type. Watch what happens to the linked version if I double click on the original and change its parameters using the star tool control bar. As you can see, there's a live linkage between the original and the linked offset, similar to a clone. The same happens if we use a text object as the original. In this case, we can still edit the original text, something that isn't possible with any of the other offsetting methods. It also means that you can create multiple offsets from the same original. That makes it dead simple to create a 70s style funky text effect. Moving to version 1, we find that we can still create a linked offset from a star. But look what happens when we double click on the original. It's no longer a star object. Moving the individual nodes shows that the link to the offset is intact, but our star has been converted into a path. Turning to the text object, you won't be surprised to see that we have the same broken behavior we saw with dynamic offset. We could work around it in the same way, use the three-step method for converting the text to a path first, then apply the linked offset command, but that still leaves us shortchanged as we're no longer able to edit the text in the same way that we could in 0.92. Fortunately, there is a solution, but it's a little complex. To understand it, let's take a look at a linked offset in 0.92 through the lens of the XML editor. As you can see, 
Much like the dynamic offset, it's actually an SVG path element. Looking at the attributes, the sodipody type is set to Inkscape offset. Yet again, we have a radius. But we also have a couple of href attributes, which are what turns this from a dynamic offset to a linked offset. The value these hold is actually the ID of the source object. To fix the linked offset issue in version 1, we need to recreate these key parts of the SVG file. But don't worry, it's not as difficult as it sounds. To start with, we'll need two objects. One is our source object, the one we want to link to. The other is a sacrificial object we'll use as a surrogate source for our linked object. It can be anything, but in this case I'm just going to use a circle. The first step is to create a linked offset from your sacrificial element. Now we'll open the XML editor. What we're going to do is change the link to point to our source object instead of the surrogate. For that we need the ID of the source object, so just select it on the canvas and it will become selected in the XML editor. Find the ID attribute and click on its value to select it. Copy that to the clipboard. Next we need to select the linked offset on the canvas so it becomes selected in the XML editor. Click to edit each of the href attributes, removing the existing ID and then pasting the one you've got on the clipboard, but make sure to leave the hash character in place. Your offset is now linked to the source object and you can safely close the XML editor and delete the surrogate. Note that the source wasn't touched or changed in any way, so you can still double click on it and edit it as you would have done in 0.92. With these workarounds you can get back to the same kind of functionality you had in 0.92, albeit requiring a few extra steps in order to achieve the same results. With luck, some of these issues might get addressed in a forthcoming release of Inkscape, but just in case, you can always fall back on these approaches and they should work for the foreseeable future. If you found this video useful or informative, please do click the like button so that YouTube is more likely to recommend it to other users. If you want to see more videos from me, don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications. If you prefer your Inkscape content in a written form or just want to tap into a huge collection of hints, tips and tricks, I've written over a hundred articles for Full Circle magazine, all of which are under a Creative Commons license and can be downloaded free of charge from the Full Circle website. With my friend Vince, I've also created over 200 cartoons and comics using Inkscape and other free software. They're all available on our website at peppertop.com and you can download the source files for most of them. Finally, if you would like to help support the work I do in creating these articles, cartoons, videos and more, please consider sponsoring me on Patreon. Thank you.